It's obvious that our boy Goku is crazy strong. He's been on lots and lots of adventures and he's seen it all. But one thing that fans always mention is that Goku doesn't really seem to have much of a brain. It's called a sensu bean! Eat up! Ah, is your brain on vacation?! Cell's used up a lot of his energy. It's only fair to let him fight Gohan at full strength, don't you think? All things considered, he was designed to be a funny character due to Toriyama's deep love of gag manga. But this wasn't always so. Goku did display level-headedness, self-control, and deep intelligence through Dragon Ball Z, most prominently in the Cell and Boo sagas. In those sagas, he took into account not just himself, but his own desires, which was something I could criticize Super for. Like, Z Goku? I don't think he would have let the Tournament of Destroyers happen. Or at least if he did, he would have been focusing more on the guilt aspect, because Goku was not some villain seeking self-gratification. He was always a true hero who knew the meaning of sacrifice for the greater good. If I push this button, then Zenny will come here. Don't you dare. I warned you, Saiyan, this is not some kind of game. Your naivety may be an even greater threat to this universe than Grand Zeno himself which was just one nitpick I had about Super. So here, we're going to take an older, wiser Goku and have him be reborn in the past with all of his memories and see what it does. Sit back and grab some Senzu beans to snack on, let's get into it. Welcome to the Amagi. Before we begin, only 25% of our viewers are subscribed, so if you're a fan of the video, please like and double check that you are subscribed, and with that out of the way, let's get into it. Wh where am I? Goku asked himself as the light of consciousness flickered within. He heard the sound of muffled voices. His tail twitched as the sound of voices could be heard. He did not know who the voices belonged to. He stirred a little. His eyes opened and he saw a yellow haze. What was this? He felt like he was choking. Choking and drowning, but all the same he was at peace. But he didn't feel required to breathe. It was as if he were back in his mother's womb. But a womb this place was not. At least not conventionally. He managed to open his eyes for a moment and saw a man there. A man with black armor and spiky hair. Himself? No, Goku had never worn black armor. Who could it have been? A scar on the cheek, barely visible to Goku since his eyes were still in the infantile stage of development, meaning they had yet to fully shape. It was like staring through water. But that was made worse because he actually was staring through water. It had yet to occur to him that he was on planet Vegeta. After all, Goku had not remembered Planet Vegeta much. The most he had was a few flashes of his parents activated by the sudden scent of food cooking. Every so often, Chi-Chi would cook up something in the kitchen and it would strike a chord with him, like he'd been there before but couldn't remember. During his fight with Granola, he had received some insight into his past from his father's old broken scouter, but this was something brand new to him. He was experiencing it again. Despite him being curious, something was going on in this odd incubator. It was drawing him back to sleep. He couldn't hold on. His eyes closed again. He's still so small. He's a late bloomer, two voices spoke. Goku began thinking back. He recalled something happening, his life in danger, the universe in danger. What had happened to put him here? Why was he a baby again? Something about the demon realm? A man with a white ponytail, an experiment. Fu, that was it. His name was Fu. A desire to know what would happen if Goku had to do it all over again. Goku couldn't explain it. He was just here once again, experiencing his life all over. As he wanted to get around and start moving, he found himself lulled back into a state of quiet sleepiness that demanded he take a nap. Despite his protests, Goku's body refused to cooperate and he fell asleep as well. He didn't seem to wake up much until he felt something. He felt a sudden rush of cool air come over him. As his eyes began to open up, he felt the overwhelming urge to vomit, and so he did. But it wasn't his lunch he was chucking, it was that fluid. He was outside of the tank and his lungs were working hard to expel the liquid from them so they could take in oxygen naturally. Once he was acclimated, he felt a gentle yet powerful hand pull him up onto his butt and hold him there as a towel quickly dried him. Without his consent, he found himself being clothed in what felt like spandex shorts and chest armor. His body was sensitive still. It hadn't ever felt this sensitive to his knowledge. It didn't hurt, but it felt unpleasant. Even somewhat soft stuff felt coarse against his skin. Goku felt irritated, like he wanted to cry, which wasn't a response he was used to. Goku rarely cried over anything, and yet now he felt like blubbering. Guess I really am a baby, Goku thought to himself. And now, as he managed to somehow suck it up, he could see clearly for the first time. 
he took in the face of his mother and father. Filled with awe, he recognized that this was the first time he had truly interacted with them both. He could hardly remember this moment. Suddenly, as he was placed into a pod, he felt the jostling of his father carrying him through the night. He heard his parents speaking. You don't know that, Bardock. You don't know that Frieza's planning to destroy us. I just get the feeling, Jine. I could be wrong, and if I am, I'll just go pick Kakarot up. But if I'm right, Goku realized it. Wait, this is when Frieza blew up the Saiyans. This is when Planet Vegeta was destroyed. Hey, hey, Dad, open up. Dad! That was what Goku was trying to say, of course, but all his body was currently trained to produce right now was the sound of cooing, random screams, and crying. No words he was trying to scream were getting out. As the pod was set down, Goku pressed his face up against the glass. Dad! Mom! Escape! Escape! Tell the Saiyans to escape! Tell King Vegeta! But his words didn't seem to reach them. They just smiled. Jine then spoke. We'll be there to pick you up soon, Kakarot. No, Mom! You won't! Please! For the love of mercy, I beg of you, get in the pod! Mom! Bardock placed his hand against the glass. I'll see you soon, Kakarot. Suddenly, the pod began to rise. Goku screamed and lashed out. He wanted to mess with the controls and make it land again, but he could hardly reach them. He couldn't fly, and he wasn't strong enough to even break them. I'm helpless. I'm freaking helpless. At this point, Goku began to cry, and this wasn't just a response that his childlike body had chosen. No, he was truly crying now. If he had been an adult here, he'd be crying. The knowledge that his parents, his people, were going to die and there was nothing he could do to stop it. Goku tried to achieve Super Saiyan, trying to somehow use this rage as a catalyst, trying to once again achieve the form he so commonly relied upon. Come on, body! Quickly! He screamed, strained, and cried out. For a moment, there was a golden glow in his hair, but it faded almost immediately. He just didn't have the power level to achieve such a form. His body would be unable to handle it. In his frustration, Goku began wrestling with himself, wrestling with this damned armor. It was annoying him. He was so full of rage and sorrow as he passed into space beyond, he ripped the armor right off of him. He threw it down on the floorboard. Looking at the armor that made him match his father, Goku had never felt such an emotion for a man he hardly knew. And now, he would never have the chance to know him. As the pod flew in the direction of Earth, it once again released a sleeping agent, just as the incubation pod had in his father's home. It was a long journey to Earth, and Goku couldn't help but sleep. Goku would sleep until he hits the atmosphere of Earth. The turbulence shakes him up and wakes him. Huh? Where am I? Goku began to wonder. Suddenly, the shaking slowed. He almost fell asleep again until a sudden crash sent him out of his seat and up against the padding of the pod, before bouncing him back down on the seat and then upon the wall again before returning him back to the seat. Goku began to cry again. Despite his tears, he was relatively unhurt. Despite being considered weak by Saiyan standards, Goku was a rather resilient baby by human standards. And that being said, the padding had helped keep him from hurting himself, but it definitely wasn't pleasant. He continued to cry until he heard something outside. Footsteps. Slowly approaching, they grew louder and louder. Eventually, the pod's main hatch opened with a hiss. He heard the wind and the birds chirping. The stuffy air that had been recycled over and over again had finally been replaced with a natural, cool air. Suddenly, a silhouette appeared at the pod's entrance. A gentle hand reached in and picked him up. Goku's face, no longer crying, twisted in confusion. It was then that he saw him. The white mustache, the loving gaze, and the warm yet slightly grizzled complexion. Grandpa Gohan, Goku said as he looked into the eyes of the man he revered the most. Goku began crying again. The man pulled him into his embrace. These were not tears of sorrow, but tears of joy. The tears of a child who had lost something important and finally found it again. Gohan. Goku clutched tightly to the man, as if afraid he might disappear again if Goku let go. A clingy little fella, aren't you? Gohan said. He continued to look at the pod. Where did you come from? He asked as he retraced the path of the pod toward the skies. Did you come down from heaven to me? Are you my little angel from heaven? Gohan looked at the boy. To be frank, Gohan was old. He had never settled down and never had a child of his own, but deep down he always wanted to know the joy of raising one, to feel the love and to share his wisdom. Maybe this was heaven's gift to him. Gohan smiled. I think that's perfect. I'll name you Goku because you're sent from the sky. I'll spell your name with the kanji for sky. The elderly man brought Goku home with him. The entire time for days, Goku refused to be anywhere but around Grandpa Gohan. He refused to even let Gohan use the bathroom alone, afraid somehow he might lose the old man or that by going to sleep he might wake up and it would all just be a dream. As the time began to pass though, Goku grew old enough to walk and move about on his own. Gohan began attempting to teach Goku martial arts. 
Gohan found Goku to be quite gifted. Goku seemed to have the ability to close his eyes, clear his mind, and dodge any attack that came his way. Gohan had never seen anyone but Master Roshi display such an ability. Goku seemed well-versed in all forms, and it almost seemed as if there was nothing that Gohan could teach him. Goku would begin to explain it. Grandpa Gohan? Yes, Goku, he asked. Goku thought he might sound a little crazy, but he knew that if anyone would believe him, Gohan would. What if I said I knew exactly what was going to happen? Gohan looked back. What do you mean? Goku continued. I know what the Dragon Balls are. I know about you, and about Master Roshi, and about the Ox King. I know about Piccolo. I know about all of it, and the reason why I know this is because I've lived through this life before. I can't explain how I ended up back in this moment, but I've lived a whole lifetime and now I've returned to here. Gohan took his seat at the table as he finished setting up a massive meal for the both of them. I'd always suspected that you might. You did? Goku asked. Gohan nodded. I wasn't sure about the specifics, but I knew you had knowledge you couldn't have picked up here. But you say you actually came from the future? Goku nodded. He then blessed his food and began digging in. Gohan would begin eating too, thinking about it. Well, if this is true, then you know that time is something that should be out of the hands of us mortals, right? Goku nodded. Yeah, it's in the hands of people like Supreme Kai and Whis. Gohan pretended that he knew who those people were. Yeah, well, about that, you need to be careful. Try not to change too much, Goku. There are always dire consequences when man starts to meddle in the domain of God. Goku knew this as truth. The moment he had achieved a divine transformation, a lot of things changed. One thing of note being Trunks' world. That was when his own strength had led to the future being ruined for Trunks because of the misuse of Goku's body due to Zamasu's wish to Super Shenron to steal it as a weapon against the mortals. Goku didn't want to mess with too much, of course, but he did want to ensure that the world was safe and secure. That being said, Goku had known that during his last run-through of this life, he had made many mistakes. Mistakes that had made Earth suffer in some ways. Goku knew he couldn't and shouldn't change all of them, but some of the things he began to wonder if it would be okay to change. After all, Goku had been in these last few years, as his body developed, thinking about the future. I know I shouldn't affect too much, Grandpa, but I know of many things I could change for the better. If you choose that, Goku, there could be consequences. If there are, I'll deal with them. I feel like this second chance is a gift to me, something I should do. Gohan sat there and smiled softly. If that is what you think you should do, Goku, then I support you. Goku walked over and hugged his grandpa. As time further passed, Goku remembered what he had known about Gohan and about the future, about how he had crushed Gohan in the past. Goku thought about the full moon and about his tail. He wanted to rip his own tail off now, knowing that it was a danger to those he loved. But he remembered seeing another vision of himself when he saw Fu. This version of him had a strange transformation he'd never seen before, a powerful one, and it was accessed through the use of the tail. Goku wondered what he should do. He decided that having a tail wasn't a bad thing, so long as he had enough control not to stare at the full moon so long as he kept the tail. If he did that, there was no telling what he could do with it. Days passed into weeks and into months, and after a couple more years, the event Goku had been waiting for was set to arrive. As he went out fishing, he heard the sound of a car approaching. That must be her, Goku said as he rushed to the road. He stood there carrying the large fish he had caught. A car was on its way. Bulma saw him coming. Out of the way, she shouted as she blew the horn and poured on the brakes. She smashed into Goku so hard that the entire front end was destroyed. This didn't seem to affect Goku much as he hadn't even moved an inch. Bulma crawled out of the car. I just killed a child, she said with panic in her voice. No, you didn't. I'm right here, he said. She freaked out and pulled out her pistol and began firing at him. Apparently, her thought process was that if he wasn't dead yet, she would make him. Goku deflected the bullets with his finger alone. Bulma kept squeezing the trigger until there were no bullets left, and then continued squeezing the trigger a bit more after. Goku walked up to her and knelt down. No need to be alarmed. I'm a hillbilly, not a serial killer. He offers her his hand. She takes it. Remembering what Grandpa Gohan had said to Goku, Goku feels it's important to play dumb with her. He knows, of course, that she's here for the Dragon Balls. Despite that, he pretends that he doesn't really know, going about acting the exact way he normally would have at this moment. He feels kind of bad, like he's manipulating her, but he knows it's important for him to not come off as a weirdo during first impressions or she'll never befriend him. And frankly, he wants her to befriend him. Not only would it help him keep track of his own timeline, but also Goku didn't like the idea of living a life with even one of his friends missing. So he takes her back to his home where Gohan is. Gohan opens the door and is surprised. Wow, Goku. I always knew that one day you'd be bringing home a girl to receive my blessings, but aren't you a little young for that? You're 12. Bulma is a little shaken by this, but maintains her cool. Goku enters the house with Gohan and begins to explain it to him. 
This girl's name is Bulma. She's an important friend of mine in the future. She's here for your four star ball and we gotta give it to her, but only in a way that convinces her to take me along with her on the journey or stuff will get messed up. Gohan understands this, but does this mean that you're leaving me? Goku hadn't stopped to think about how Gohan might feel about this. He stops for a moment and thinks, uh, well, I mean, yeah, but he looks at Gohan's sad face. I'll come back, I just, he hugs Gohan. Sometimes there are things we have to do, even if we don't want to do them. Didn't you teach me that? That sometimes the greater good's more important than any one of us. Gohan rubbed the back of Goku's head as the two embraced. Yeah, I did tell you that. If this has to happen, you have my blessing. Just please, be careful. Goku nodded. I promise. Goku returned to the door. Remember when I said we were hillbillies? Don't mind my grandpa. Bulma, still a little freaked out, enters the residence. What brings you here, Gohan says. I'm searching for the Dragon Balls. She pulls one out of her pocket. If I gather them all, you get to summon a dragon and you get a wish, Gohan said, finishing her sentence. Oh, so you know them, she tells him. Gohan nods. I know all about the legend. It's what made me want to go collect the Dragon Balls myself. But sadly, all I ever found was this one. He pointed toward the four-star ball. Bulma sees it. Well, I've been tracking them down myself. I don't suppose there's a way I can convince you to give me the ball, she asked. She pulled out a cell phone. I have money, lots of it. I'll pay you a million zenny, no, ten million. Gohan's eyes widened. Ten? He looked down at Goku, who was staring at him intently, telling him that there was something he should ask for instead. Gohan looks down and nods. No, my dear, I am but a humble man living in the mountains. Despite my younger years and my dreams of treasure, I've grown content. Money means nothing to me anymore. What matters is my grandson, Goku. My grandson's been cooped up in this old hut his entire life, and he needs to go out and see the world, visit places, meet people. I'll give you the ball for free if you take my grandson with you. Bulma looks down at Goku for a moment. You, uh, you sure you wouldn't rather I just give you 100 million zenny? Gohan grabbed his chest. My soul, girl! Are you trying to make me have a heart attack? No! You take my grandson with you or you don't get the ball. End of story. Your answer is either yes or you walk right back out that door and never return. Bulma rolled her head on her neck with a sigh and then looked down. Fine, I'll take the squirt with me. Wherever I go, he goes. That fair? Gohan smiled. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. He stood and walked over to the counter where his four star was sitting. He picked it up and turned around with it. He handed it to Goku. Keep it with you always, and remember that wherever you go, my love follows. Goku took it. He then stood, got his stuff together, and walked over to Bulma. I am ready to go. She sighed and stood. Don't look so down, Gohan said to her. It's always better to go on a journey with a friend. It might increase your chances of survival and success. And trust me, my grandson is very strong. He'll serve you well. Let's hope so, because I don't want to be slowed down, Bulma said. She then takes out a Hoi Poi capsule and activates it, revealing a motorcycle with a sidecar. Get in, monkey boy. Goku jumps into the sidecar. Together, the two ride off into the sunset. Now, Goku doesn't really attempt to change much here. He stays with Bulma for the night, and as soon as he sees the turtle, he takes it back to the sea. One of his more important friendships is with his master, Roshi. And he knows that turtle is connected to Roshi, and through rescuing turtle, he'll begin befriending Roshi. It's through this that they get another Dragon Ball. They would encounter Oolong and stop him from continuing in the errors of his ways and free all the girls he kidnapped. Eventually, they encounter Yamcha as well, and Puar too. None of this changes because Goku knows it's important. Eventually, they make it to Mount Frypan, the home of the Ox King and his daughter Chi-Chi. The mountain is on fire, and Goku knows that the only way to get the Dragon Ball is by putting out the fire. Ox King tells him that if they get the Bansho fan, it will allow them to pull out the fire. Goku, however, decides that instead he'll use a Kamehameha, knowing that this fetch quest doesn't really amount to much anyway. He puts it out, but ends up destroying the castle in the process. Now, Goku could have put the fire out with his Kamehameha without destroying the mountain, but he knows this is pretty important. Not long after, he meets Chi-Chi. Upon seeing her for the first time again after so many years, Goku's heart palpitates, and his face grows a bit red, something Ox King and Chi-Chi notice. This causes Chi-Chi's face to redden a bit as she realizes that she finally has an admirer. Goku asks for Ox King to give them the Dragon Ball, and in exchange, he says he'll marry Chi-Chi when they both come of age. Ox King happily agrees. Goku then goes to Chi-Chi. He takes her hand. I know you don't know me yet, but I really do love you, Chi-Chi. There are a few things that are on my mind besides food and fighting, and those things will soon include you. If you will, I'd like to offer myself to be your husband one day. Do you accept? 
Chi Chi is so shocked by this she passes out. Goku stands there for a moment. I'll take that as a yes. They then continue their journey. During this time, they end up captured by the Pilaf gang with Yamcha and Puar. During this time, Pilaf summons Shenron. Oolong manages to escape confinement with the help of Goku and foils their plan. However, Goku and the others are captured again and put in a box to bake. Goku goes up and sees glass and the full moon. He immediately looks away, not wanting to turn into a great ape. Goku charges a Kamehameha and fires it at the glass, but the glass instead lets the energy pass through and even amplifies it as it fires out towards space. Goku attempts to strike the glass with multiple attacks, but can't break through. Goku sits there for a moment and thinks about it. Guys? Bulma, Yamcha, Puar, and Oolong look over at Goku. What is it? Bulma asks. Goku looks over. I'm gonna do something pretty dangerous. You know my tail? Well, I don't think you realize this, but I'm not human. I'm a space alien, and uh, if I look at the moon, I actually turn into this massive monkey. I can do that now to escape, but if I do that, it'll be dangerous. When we escape, I need you to flee as far away from me as possible, as fast as you can, and don't approach me till morning. Can you promise me that? The group thinks he's insane, but Goku's face shows them that he's serious. Bulma, thinking about just how odd the tale is, begins to believe Goku. Okay, just try your best not to hurt us, she says. Goku nods. He then takes a deep breath and clears his mind. He looks up toward the moon and feels his endorphins rushing. He feels his heartbeat in every part of his body. He then feels thousands of years of conquest and battle knowledge being poured into his mind as the cage around the darkest part of his pure heart begins to open. Slowly, he begins to change, much to Poir and Yamcha's surprise. Goku grows into a great ape and smashes the wall for them. They then begin to escape. As they do, Goku begins to rampage. With whatever ability he had, he intentionally disregarded Bulma and the others. It was a risk, but Goku wanted to keep his tail. Though he knew it would eventually grow back on its own, he knew that the power in his tail symbolized a potential that surpassed his base form, and could be utilized later if Goku could manage to master it. As the day approached, Goku reverted back to his human form. However, knowing that he's no longer needed by them, Goku bids his friends farewell for the time being, and makes his way to Roshi's house, where he plans to train, along with who would eventually show up, Krillin. Here, pretty much everything stays the same. Goku indulges Roshi and Krillin and trains with them, focusing on growing stronger. He remembers what it was like when he fought in the Tournament of Power, how strong he was then. Now, he was back to nothing, but that didn't mean he couldn't be strong again. He just had to start over, and sometimes it was good getting back to basics. He trained with Roshi until Roshi thought that they were ready for the tournament, where not only did Goku make it to the finals, but he also beat Jackie Chun, Roshi in disguise, and went back on to prove how strong he had truly gotten. After this, he knew he would need to deal with the next big threat, the Red Ribbon Army. While it was a simple terrorist organization now, not too strong, something even Earth's military could handle, he knew that leaving them to their own devices would inevitably lead to the end of the world, especially knowing that the androids during future Trunks' time would destroy everything. Despite that, he knew that he wanted 17 and 18 to survive, as they both became good friends, and would be responsible for helping him in the Tournament of Power later. Without 17, the world would end, so he knew that despite everything, he needed Jiro to survive. And so, Goku began attacking various different groups. Goku avoided Upa's village though because he felt there'd be no point in allowing Bora to die. Instead, Goku took on the army alone, destroying the Muscle Tower, defeating Tao and Staff Officer Black, and ending up the threat of the Red Ribbon Army. After that, he would return to Upa's village and be welcomed as a hero. Goku would climb Korin's tower, and would drink the Ultra Divine Water to further awaken his potential. Goku trains for a while with Korin before attempting to use his power pole to get up to Kami's lookout. Once he climbs up, he finds Kami and Mr. Popo, both of whom are amazed to find someone so young making it up there by himself. It's then that Goku begins to explain to them, I'm sure you know by now about King Piccolo. He's awakened. I know you have a life bond with him, Kami. Both Kami and Mr. Popo are astonished at Goku for having this knowledge. Goku then speaks. I need you to help me train here and grow stronger so I can defeat him. Kami and Popo look at each other for a moment before coming to a consensus. Kami looks back at Goku. What do you need? Goku enters the time chamber where he spends a year training to get as strong as he possibly can, being sure to bring with him the Senzu beans he took from Korin's tower. While in there, Goku's power level skyrockets. Once Goku exits the time chamber, only a day has passed, but for Goku it seemed like a year. He'd proceed to make his way off to the lookout. By this point, Goku has learned to fly, or should I say, remembered to fly. He begins to make his way down to the World Martial Arts Tournament where he joins up alongside Krillin. The two of them fight and Goku is, of course, the victor. He eventually goes to face off against Tien where he manages victory as well. As Goku waits, he knows that Tambourine will soon appear, and when he does, Goku is quick to kill him. This sets off King Piccolo who now knows that someone's 
Strong has appeared. Knowing that King Piccolo is after the Dragon Balls, he goes after Yajirobe, who has one of them. He defends Yajirobe from Drum, who he utterly obliterates in one shot like Saitama. Yajirobe is impressed. This, however, garners the attention of King Piccolo, who comes after Goku personally. Goku knows all of King Piccolo's tricks, and when he appears, Goku, having trained so hard in the time chamber, manages to one-shot him, punching clean through. King Piccolo is confused as to how someone could become so strong. He attempts to read Goku's mind, and there he sees many things he thought he'd never see. The future. Events yet to transpire. He also knows that Goku's power grew due to his use of the time chamber. Piccolo would then, in a moment of self-preservation, create an egg and spit it out into the distance before self-destructing. Yajirobe sees it. Hey, what's that? He pulls out his sword to destroy it, but Goku stops him. No, leave it. Yajirobe looks at Goku with confusion. Only if you're sure. He resheathes his blade. Once this is finished, Goku once again returns to Kami's lookout where he explains to Kami that he defeated Piccolo, but that Piccolo reincarnated into a younger body that he sent off to the furthest reaches. Kami commends Goku on his victory and questions him about the future. Believing he can trust Kami, given the latter's role as Guardian of Earth, Goku proceeds to reveal to Kami everything, including how Piccolo eventually becomes good and fuses again with Kami. This pleases Kami, who allows Goku to train with them on the lookout, where Goku manages to further increase his strength through another day in the hyperbolic time chamber. Goku begins to travel the world, visiting old friends and forging bonds, cleaning up anything he failed to before. After some time passes, Goku knows that he must duel Piccolo in the next martial arts tournament. When Goku arrives, he manages to beat Tien and waits for Piccolo to show up. Piccolo eventually does, and the two prepare for a duel. Goku finds it strange that Kami has yet to show up though, knowing that he was supposed to confront Piccolo, but Piccolo reveals the truth. All of those years ago, my father dove deeply into your mind to understand how a child could surpass him. There, he witnessed so many things, things he passed along to me. I too have trained much. I have trained hard, and when you left the lookout, I decided to pay Kami a visit of my own. There, I absorbed him and utilized his room of spirit and time for three days to prepare myself for this moment. Goku is shocked and angered. He tried to calm himself, but realized that he had screwed up. And now, because of him, things were off course. Piccolo and Kami had fused early, and their strength was now well beyond what it should be. And now there was a chance that Piccolo might never turn good, which weighed heavily on Goku's heart. The two began to fight. Their energy was rocketing so high that it threatened to destroy the planet. Goku pushed Piccolo back and charged a Kamehameha. Piccolo charged up a Masenko and the two beams clashed. You fool! The Dragon Balls are inert because of your actions. Anyone who dies now can't be revived. You think that bothers me. The Dragon Balls are a hindrance to my designs. Goku feels the weight of his blunder. He knows that if he leaves Piccolo to his own devices, he might destroy the world out of spite for his loss to Goku. Having dealt with Frieza enough to know, Goku knows that unless he ends Piccolo now, the world could suffer. Goku would power up his Kamehameha even further and would fire it down, evaporating Piccolo. Goku comes down to the ground and just sits there on his knees as the tears begin to drip from his eyes. Piccolo, I failed you. After this, Goku and Chi-Chi would be married and begin to settle down on Mount Paozu, a ways off from Gohan. Goku and Chi-Chi would eventually give birth to their son, which Goku decided to name after his grandfather, much to Gohan's delight. From then on, Goku prepares for the imminent arrival of the Saiyans. Though he knows he's strong enough to deal with them, he wonders what his future might bring now that Piccolo is gone. Looking back at young Gohan, Goku knows that he'll have to train the boy himself to prepare for the future. And that's where I plan to stop it for the day. I hope you enjoyed it. I thought it would be fun going back over Dragon Ball and altering what happens. The choice to kill Piccolo Jr. off early wasn't one that I had initially thought about, nor was it one that I took lightly. But in the end, I felt that if Piccolo really did see the future, he would be less likely to turn good. After all, it was his connection with Gohan that really pulled him to the light, and all of that was basically spoiled without the emotion that came with it. He also got to realize that Piccolo wouldn't want to turn good, so he might intentionally avoid Gohan now. That, on top of whatever mental fortitude he built up in preparation for absorbing Kami and remaining corrupted as he was, it likely was in the cards for him to turn good. But that also further adds to the mystery of what the future holds. Now that things are starting to get off track, what will happen for Goku? Will everything continue on as if nothing ever happened, or will it continue to deteriorate and become more and more off the rails? I guess we'll have to wait and see. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell if you want to be notified the next time a video comes around. And be sure to like the video and leave a comment below to tell us what you thought, other video ideas, or what you'd like to see in the future. And while you wait for the future to get here, try one, or both, of these videos to tide you over. Anyway, until next time, peace out.